Are you haunted by unfinished business at your nonprofit? Spooked about witchy board members? <laughs> Afraid of skeletons in your nonprofit closet? Don't worry, my little ghouls and goblins. You're safe with us at Charity Therapy. <laughs> Running nonprofits should be a treat, not a trick. Welcome to Charity Therapy, a podcast about building better nonprofits. I'm your host, Jess Birkin. Okay, so today uh, my guest is the intrepid Jordan Couch. Um, Jordan happens to be a lawyer and my friend. But Jordan, I think you also have some nonprofit experience as well, right? Yeah. Uh not these days. I'm currently a lawyer doing personal injury and workers' compensation out in Tacoma. But when I was in law school, I helped run a pro bono legal clinic that worked with victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. So a little bit of work there. Right on. I also saw on your website that you worked at NASA, and I thought that was deeply cool and nerdy. <laughs> yeah, it was the weirdest thing. I ever got to do some fun legal work for NASA. It was interesting. I can only imagine. Um, well, so what's interesting uh, about doing this today, other than it's our Halloween episode, is <laughs> <laughs> that I think it would be cool to do some listener Q&A with you, um, just because the both of us are lawyers, and so why not? So would you be up for that? I think that is a phenomenal idea. Okay, right on. Well, I'm going to let you go ahead and deal with question number one and we shall be off to the races listener question number one our nonprofit works closely with the local goblin elementary school the principal asked our group if we would be able to purchase a van or hearse for the school own it for the school carry the insurance on it but let them use it to transport little goblins and ghouls as needed my board is worried about whether we should do this you know, you have to be really careful when kids are involved, too, because the last thing you want is to do something messed up and have kids go crying home to mummy. Oh, all right. Well, uh, you know, don't let it get too complicated because you don't want to end up with a Franken van. <laughs> <laughs> this is a pretty complicated situ situation. They've kind of developed into this, unfortunately. Um, it is, and I mean, this is a real this is a real question. Even though we've made it absolutely Halloween puntastic, um, what's your reaction to this, Jordan? Because I'm I've got a reaction. And I'm curious to hear what your thoughts would be for this person, you this know, nonprofit. Yeah, I firmly believe when lawyers work with businesses, you know, the job is to say yes, but the way you do it is you say sometimes yes, and this is what I need for you to do this, and this is one of those where. You know, it's not, it doesn't sound like it's the ideal situation. I think, you know, there's a way you can do this, but you're taking on a lot of risk and there's going to be a lot of work you have to do to make sure you're protected doing something like this. Yeah, that would, that's absolutely where I'm at too. I'm like, okay, we're going to need to get all of this in writing and some kind of disclaimers. The other thing that jumps to my mind is I would really want this nonprofit to actually talk to somebody at the district level because it says that the principal asked them from the local school but in my experience working with school districts they have in-house attorneys that work with them and they represent the entire district not just a particular school and I, I have a hard time imagining that the school district would actually be okay with this or even let this move forward. So I would want them to go check it out with the district. And I'll tell you, my biggest concern on this, you know, coming from the personal injury side is the insurance on this, right? If they're carrying the insurance and someone else is using it, you might run into some serious issues of whether or not the insurance, you know, applies. And the last thing you want to have is, you know, this bus to get into an accident. And now your insurance is fighting with the school's insurance while someone else is trying to sue both you and the school's insurance. And it can turn into a, that you know, can create a big mess for you. And you might be covered, you might be okay, you might have insurance, but, you know, as one of my law professors like to say, that doesn't mean they're not going to get into court. And who goes to, who wins when you go to court? No one. Right? True that. Um, yeah. And the other thing is, 
it sounded to me like the school would be doing everything. So I'm sort of like, why would the nonprofit want to take on this risk anyway? And that is kind of a question, you know, that comes up with a lot of these things that get a little confusing like this is, you know, why doesn't the school just ask you to donate a van? Right. You know, that's something you can do. Um, Is it the cost? Can you donate a van and also donate a little extra money to the school to help them pay for insurance? Where's this? Why why the shifting risk? Well, and I I do know from some of the groups that I've worked with that um, busing and transportation is actually one of the most expensive things. So, like, I worked with a group that supports a national uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Wildlife Refuge, and they actually had a fund that would pay for the busing to bring the kids to the refuge because the schools co- just simply couldn't afford to like have that extra busing cost to participate in that programming. So I think that's probably where the school is coming from with this. But I like your idea. Just just raise money for the van and donate it if you could. Or even, you know, for the van and some insurance to go forward or to cover costs of it. But it sounds like, you know, from this, that the, the school has drivers for it. Um, you know, they have. So I'm wondering, does the school have an existing system as well that this van would be getting incorporated into? Because if the school has, you know, has buses or has vans already that they're carrying insurance on, that they're having in their system, and this van is just being an add into that system. I don't know. You know, you might get a little even more convoluted that way. Yeah. Ultimately, though, I think the board is right to be worried about whether they should go into this. And I would probably say they they should do some more due diligence before making any kind of decision. I agree. For sure. And talking to the district is a really good idea. Yeah. All right. So what else do we have? All right. Listener question number two. A few years ago, I started a nonprofit, but then life got chaotic for me, taking care of my mom, I haven't raised any money, and I was not able to get the work of the nonprofit going. The board members are basically ghosts, and we haven't met for over a year. I just got a notice from the IRS that our tax exemption was revoked. I'm probably behind on my corporate registration, too. I kind of want to quit, but I'd also like to be able to bring it back to life at some point if my life settles down. What should I do? You know, it sounds to me like They've got a little bit of unfinished business there. Yeah, it sounds like this uh, nonprofit is is haunting her. It's gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be a skeleton in her closet. But thankfully, at Halloween, bringing things back to life is our specialty. Um, one thing that jumps out at me right away about this question is the fact that it's I. I didn't do this. I haven't raised money. I'm behind. There's no we referenced in here at all, which is kind of telegraphs to me that this person probably had a board that was not. A lot of times what in my experience with working with founders, the founder is like the one who is passionate about this. And sometimes they will just be like, hey, you're my brother, and hey, you're my friend. Will you be on my board so I can get this thing done? Because I legally have to have at least three people on this board. And that uh, seems like a good idea sometimes, but what happens is these board members end up turning into ghosts. They're apparitions and poltergeists when it comes to actually doing the work. And so if our founder's life got chaotic, taking care of her sick parent, sounds to me like this board wasn't really on board with their mission um, because it sounds like she was doing everything by herself. One good thing that does seem to be going for this, though, is it does sound like she's doing everything by herself. There aren't other employees that have to be worried about and something like that. It sounds like it's kind of she's doing it. Um, You know, I think, yeah, there's there's some opportunity there. I think one of the bigger questions is, you know, what needs to be done to properly close it if they want to close it to make sure that it is able to come back to life if they want to later on? Or is it something that can be run in the background a little while? You know, if you're not raising money all the time, you can have something kind of static and sit a little bit. Yeah, so there's a couple of things with that here. One is it is possible to have sort of a zombie nonprofit. Um, At least in the state where I'm sitting, 
the Secretary of State's office that does the corporate registrations will involuntarily dissolve you if you fail to register. And that's really not a proper dissolution. Um, there's a statutory process, at least in my state, for dissolving a nonprofit or for-profit corporation. And you would have to follow that process to be properly dissolved, but effectively you could just let it go and be sort of in this weird nonprofit purgatory and then resuscitate it break get your franken nonprofit uh zapped back to life at some future date by simply re-registering or renewing the registration the bigger problem i think is the irs revoking their tax status yeah and there's no indication of you know where that what, what might have caused that as well um and i think Oh. Well, I think it was just probably for non-filing okay. because they say it was a few years and the IRS by default will revoke your tax exempt status after three years if you don't file. So you could be around for 15 years and you forget to file your 990s three years in a row and the IRS will revoke you. Um, but again, you could... You can bring this this back to life, right? You can do a voodoo witch doctor zombie dance and apply for reinstatement from the IRS. It's just a big pain in the butt. And my question, looking at that too, would be, you know, if you do just kind of let it let it go death, let it go silent, I guess, into its coffin, is it going to be a bigger hassle bringing it back to life, or is there a way you can kind of close it up a little simpler right now to allow it to come back to life? You know, wrap it up, embalm it, get it all prepared for death first. <laughs> um, I love it. I uh, the the bummer about this is the IRS revocation. They will have to go through the application process again. So, there's really no way around that. And what they could have done, which would have been better considering that they want to keep the nonprofit sort of in this um cryogenic cold storage or whatever <laughs> um they could have just filed a 990 postcard which is like a two-minute process online as long as you brought in less than 50 grand in revenue every year you can file that postcard and just sort of limped it along for a while uh this way i mean they can bring it back but there's no way to get around redoing your application so whether so. they wrap it up now or they do it later on, they're going to have to redo the application. There's no benefit necessarily in doing it now. So mm -mm. if you want to let well, it go. Well, technically, if you did it right now, you could slide in with a retroactive reinstatement if you file your reapplication within 15 months of the data revocation. Oh, that's some jargon right there. Um, <laughs> I was about to say. So you, yeah, you could... But, like, this person doesn't sound like they want to spend time and money doing that. So you could, but it would cost money or it would take time. Yeah. And this person doesn't seem like they're at a point in their life where they really have the, the time to do that sort of thing. So. Yeah. yeah, I feel like new nonprofits are a lot like restaurants. You know, 9 out of 10 fail in the first year or two. And this sounds kind of like one of those, unfortunately. But it's good that you have the spirit to kind of, you know, bring this back if you want to and hold on to that. Yeah, for sure. Don't let your passion for the mission die, even if this organization isn't the vehicle that you're going to do your important work through. You may end up volunteering somewhere that's got a similar mission. And in the future, you might find some more passionate board members. You know, there, if you care this much about it, there will be other people that care that much about it. Well, and that's a great point because if you really can't get, this is what I tell my founder clients that are struggling to find a board. If you can't get three people to be passionate about your mission, you have bigger problems. Don't go into the haunted <laughs> house alone. Get your oh, friends right. with you. That's right. Oh, so what else should we talk about, Jordan? So I had a question I wanted to talk about. It's, it's been a while since I was in this situation, but I and a few other classmates, like I said, uh, ran a legal aid clinic in law school that helped victims of vampire bites. I think that's what I said. Um, 
<laughs> and because it was a law student driven organization, there was in some ways a complete turnover of all leadership and volunteers every three years because you had law students going through it. And there were there was one professor who supervised a lot of stuff, but you know, things changed pretty quickly and work could carry on beyond that three years, let alone beyond, you know, one year when leadership might turn over a little bit. So coming into leadership in that was a little scary, to say the least. I had no idea what skeletons were in the closet. Um, what was I was dealing with sometimes in some of these cases and you're coming into this and saying okay now you're in charge and it's like well am I in charge of other people's mistakes so one question I had really for you was how would you recommend that a new leader in a long-standing nonprofit protect themselves and really come into something you know that's a great question um you don't want to end up in a 501c werewolf where everything seems fine until the full moon comes out yeah I mean, this is kind of an interesting one because student groups are sort of a a different beast than sort of your your garden variety nonprofit just because you do have such high turnover. I know, you know, I've worked with some student groups and they're, it's like two years, one year later, you have an entirely new board and um, I, the new leader coming in is in a little bit of a tight spot there because unless the organization already has a really great process around exit interviews or succession planning, you might just be coming in and sort of having no clue what's been going on. So to some degree, no matter you know how great you are, you're kind of at the, the mercy of of how haunted their house is, right? Um, what do you think are the most important things to kind of check in and look in? Say like, you know, with, within six months of taking over leadership, what are the things you should audit yourself and kind of take a look at? Well, for sure, I would wanna look at the governance and just see um, how, what are our organi organizing documents, right? How do our bylaws work? How do our articles work? Are those, have those things been updated in the last 10, 15 years? Are we actually running our organization according to our bylaws? Those would be some like base level 101. I would also probably want to talk to, so if you're coming in as like the new board chair or president or whatever of this student association, I would probably want to um, try and find time to have coffee or a phone call with some of the outgoing folks if they're willing to give you some time just to get a sense for you know, where were we at with things? Another great way to do that if you're not able to connect with those folks individually is to actually review like the last year of meeting minutes, assuming that there are meeting minutes and that they're kept in a way that a person could actually read. Um, a lot of times that is not the case. So that's why my go-to is like, let's talk to people first. But I think taking a look at the meeting minutes and all of these are, not only opportunities for you to educate yourself about the organization and what's been happening with it, but also um, to like identify areas that where we might need some improvement so that the next round of leadership coming in has a better situation than you do. Um, and then I think like if the organization has any kind of staff, like support staff or long-term volunteers, those people are probably your greatest resource. Like anywhere there's been a point of continuity um, that you can at least talk to them and figure out, you know, organizational history is a really good thing. I think that's good. One of the gifts I had that was the leadership team right before me um, put in place was they wrote out, you know, nice spell books of all the things that happened in all of your job duties and all of that. Um, so you, you get to kind of look down that, memorize the incantations, and you could follow that framework because they had a perfect little book for it already set up for you. And actually part of what we did was update it in every year. Yeah, which is great. Sounds like it was a top shop. That's really awesome. I say every year. I did it my year. I'm hoping the person I brought, brought in place underneath me did it as well. She's a friend. She better have. Well, that's awesome. I think that's good advice for, you know, it's like going on a nature hike, right? You want to leave the place better than when you found it. And I think that's true with any of our temporary positions at in nonprofit leadership is, you know, try and bit better than you found it. So, so you're suggesting I don't TP the forests? 
<laughs> no, no, no egging the spirits, houses. The, the haunted spirits of the forest would not be happy with you for that, Jordan. All right, no egging for me then. Well, Jordan, what do you have going on for volunteer work in your life right now? You know, a lot of bar association activity. That's my biggest stuff. I get to do a little pro bono work, but these days I do as much as I can giving back to the legal profession. So working with state bars, local bars, now the national bar. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. So it's it's good organization to be a part of. But talking about, you know, how much you rely on the staff. Oh, my gosh. When I work with bar associations where you have lawyer leadership turnover all the time, I rely on the staff on a daily basis with that stuff because we come in as volunteers for a year term and they're like, you have no idea what's going on. Let me just take care of you. <laughs> Thankfully, those are big organizations where the staff has been there a long time. Yep. Staff are indispensable. And full of lawyers. So you don't have to worry about compliance as much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They've got that part covered at that organization, don't they? It's a hydra. Everywhere a lawyer you look at, another one comes up while they're all over the place. I think that's a, probably a wrap for us today, Jordan. Any parting thoughts you want to leave us with? No, thank you so much for having me. All I have to say is don't go up to old man Dickerson's house. <laughs> because it's haunted. Cue the Scooby-Doo reveal scene where they pull off the mask. Ruh -ruh. <laughs> that was terrible. That's my best Scooby-Doo, apparently. Raggy! <gasps> All right, Jordan, well, thanks for being here, and I hope your haunted mystery machine adventures at the Bar Association are successful, and we will see you on the flip side. Thanks for having me. All right, folks, that's our show. Be sure to follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Jess Birkin. We want to hear from you. Send us a message at our website, charitytherapy.show. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at birkinlaw.com slash sign up. Charity Therapy is a production of Birkin Law Office, PLLC. Our theme song is by Whalehawk. And remember, folks, this podcast is produced for your entertainment and is not a substitute for actual legal advice. <laughs>